When my dad got up every day, he didn't go to a job. He didn't have a career. He loved what he did. He absolutely loved working with young people. Okay? He, I thought he liked getting up to go open the weight room at 6 in the morning. Then he enjoyed being at school all day. I don't think he ever missed a school lunch. He loved school lunch. And then I knew how much he loved going to football practice. And it wasn't work. And so as a young person, I saw that. And I decided at a young age, I want to do something I'm going to enjoy each and every day of my life. And young people, my hope for you is that you don't have jobs when you're older. I don't even want you to have careers when you're older. I want you to have passions. I don't want you to hate going to work every single day. Because if you do that, you will never maximize what you could be. So at your age, you're, oh, why do I go to high school? I don't need to know algebra and I don't need to know all these different things that they're trying to teach me. Maybe true. But I'll tell you this, you need to know how to work hard. You need to know how to study. You need to know how to interact with other people. Because half the jobs you young people are going to have someday don't even exist right now. Don't even exist. If you want to be rich at your age, I can firmly, I 100% believe this. If you want to be rich, you know what you can be really, really good at and make a lot of money? Communicating with other people. Because your generation... That's how you communicate. If you want to make money someday, you don't have to be the smartest person anymore. You have to be able to relate to people, to talk to people, to lead people, to motivate people. And my hope today through my talk, I'm going to try to give you some things that hopefully you will help you become a better leader of people. Okay? But as a third grader, my dad would always say, talk to the football team, beginning of practice, he'd say, you never know when you're going to have a platform, and you never know when you're going to have an opportunity. So I grew up thinking, when I was in high school, I would tell you, platforms and opportunities. To me, what that meant was, if I always do what's right, if I always do what I'm supposed to do, I'm going to have platforms and opportunities to perform. Sport's a huge part of my life. I can honestly tell you, as a high school student, I didn't drink one drop of alcohol, I didn't smoke one cigarette or whatever else young people smoke today. Because I firmly believe if I did that, I would never be as good as I could. The other thing, I was scared to death of my dad. And that's a good thing, young people. You should be somewhat afraid of your parents and respect them. My dad would talk to every young person he taught or coached and tell them, don't use drugs, don't use alcohol. And if his own son would have been out there doing that, because here's the thing, you young people, you know who drinks in your school. You know. Us teachers, adults, we may not, but you guys know. And if I would have done that, I truly believe, okay, I won't be the best I can be. I'm not going to have the opportunities, the experiences that I could have by not being all in, fully invested. So platforms and opportunities, always good things. In 2005, my dad's the National High School Football Coach of the Year. From AP, 3,000 people. We had four NFL players in 2005. So ESPN came and they did a piece on our school and on my dad and our community. And then he gets to go to the Super Bowl that year. And he gets an award. And when he speaks, so imagine going to a banquet where you get to receive your award, and it's also the same time they recognize the Hall of Fame class for the NFL that year. So my dad's seeing every Hall of Fame football member is at this banquet. And they said, Ed, you got five minutes to talk. Talk about whatever you want to talk about. And on my dad's largest stage with his platform and opportunity, he talked about what he was most proud of. He talked about this school, Applington Parkersburg. Because in his mind, he truly believed AP was the greatest place on earth. And I will tell you, because he believed it, every student who passed through these halls and sat in his desk also thought they were from somewhere special. Teachers and advisors, if you don't think you have the best school in the entire state of Iowa, I promise you, your young people won't either. And the further up the ladder you go, the more important that attitude is. My dad would tell us, you're from somewhere special. He'd say, when you graduate, never forget where you came from. So by telling us these things all the time, we'd really thought, hey, we're from somewhere, we're from somewhere special. We're worth re coming home to, remembering. But that starts with a culture. And it started with one guy who truly believed it. Coach Kearns, who you're going to hear from later, he told me before my dad got here, you know, <laughs> yeah, my dad loved football. They only had one winning season from 1952 to 1972. Prior to we got here, my dad coached for 34 years here. He had one losing season. Kids weren't different. Mindset and culture was different. 
And while I'll tell you, young people, mindset and culture, your adults will shape it and believe it, but ultimately it comes down to you believing it as well. Because I can think it's the greatest school on earth, but my young people down front here don't believe it, won't invest in it, don't act it. It's just going to be my hope, my dream, and I'm going to spin my wheels trying to make it the best it can be. First time I learned platforms and opportunities aren't always because of good things. May 25th, 2008, our community was hit by an EF5 tornado. One third of our people lost their homes that day. Seven people lost their lives from Parkersburg, one from the neighboring town of New Hartford. Imagine everybody sitting right here and over, you no longer have a house. That's what happened. That's what happened. One third of our people no longer have a home. All of a sudden, every major news network, television station in the country's here. You know how it works, Weather Channel comes, they show all the devastation. Then I say they always try to find the village idiot to interview. I guess my dad was a village idiot or a leader, I hope a leader. But they found him and they interviewed him. And they were setting him up, they were saying, oh, what are you gonna do now? What's gonna happen to your community? How will you ever rebuild? How can you ever move forward? And I'll never forget, listen to my dad's response. What he said was, and he was teary-eyed and he was emotional. You know the biggest reason my dad was emotional? Because his high school was destroyed. Killed him. Yeah, our, my parents lost everything they owned. Their house was destroyed. That didn't bother my dad near as much as it bothered him that the school was destroyed. But when they asked him that, I'll never forget his response. He said, well, we're going to dust ourselves off. We're going to get ourselves up and we're going to move forward. He said, Parkersburg will be better after this tornado than it was prior. And when I listened to that, what jumped out to me was this. I never heard my dad say I. That whole interview. He never said, I'm sad I lost my belongings. I'm sad I lost my classroom. I'm sad that football field's ruined. Never once was it I. It was we. Every part of it was we. So on his platform, his opportunity, on what he probably the worst day, worst thing he experienced, seeing everything destroyed, he was optimistic. And it took one person to start. And I'll tell you, it wasn't just my dad, Mr. Thompson, our superintendent did an unbelievable. Our school was built in 13 months, not planning to build a school. It's because people got after it, they worked hard, and they were focused. And I will tell you, Parkersburg is better today than it was in 2008. Our enrollment's up over 100 students. We have a beautiful auditorium now. We have two gymnasiums for practice. We have plenty of classrooms. But it took, in the toughest of times, getting yourself up and moving forward, and in that moment, not feeling sorry for yourself, but getting up. For me, my platform, my opportunity came June 24, 2009. That was the day my dad was killed in the bus barn down there when he came into the school building. On that day, never once could I imagine my father being murdered. We hadn't had a murder in Parkersburg since 1923 prior to that. Never thought that happened. Never believed 22 young people would be in the weight room that day and experience the entire thing. So as I go to the hospital, beat my mom there, as we're leaving, my dad had passed, but I had the opportunity to go and see him. As we're leaving the hospital, the Department of Criminal Investigation tells my mother and I, hey, we need a press release from your family. So they assign us some lady who's going to help us write this press release. And so we go and we talk about what we're going to say, and this lady's telling us her thoughts. And all I can envision when you watch the news, picture pops up, word scrolls across the screen, but it always sounds like the same statement. Back to being in third grade, wanting to be just like my dad, I said, Mom, I'll go do the press conference. So that afternoon, my press, at that press conference with 100 media people, that was my platform and my opportunity. People were going to see on that day who Aaron Thomas was, and it had nothing to do with anything positive. My platform, my opportunity was happening because of the absolute worst day of my life. But I had to make a choice. What was I going to do? How was I going to respond? When I spoke that day, I'll tell you this, nothing had sank in yet when I spoke, but I was trying to say exactly what my dad would have said had he been able to be there to speak for himself. Because I knew if Ed Thomas was going to have any kind of legacy whatsoever, it would be how his family responded, not when everything's going well, but through those tough times of adversity. The other thing I can tell you, young people, I was prepared for June 24th. I didn't know it, but I was prepared. And how that happened? Because I had two loving parents. They loved me, they supported me, and when I was your age, they disciplined me. They held me accountable. Every night, my curfew was midnight from my sophomore year to my senior year, period. 
And if I got home at 12.02, I was not going anywhere for a week. And my dad did not care what my reason was. They held me accountable. My parents weren't real worried about being my best friend when I was your age. They didn't care if I was mad at them or not. We played in a state volleyball tournament my junior year. I was dating a gal who was a senior. All my buddies were staying in the hotel that night. It was a snowstorm. I'm like, oh, I'm going to get to stay. Roads are bad. Call home. Back then, I had to go to a pay phone. Quarters in. Call home. Hey, roads are terrible. I don't think I can make it. Dad said, nope, you'll be just fine. I even had a teacher get on the phone and tell my mom and dad how bad it was. My dad said, you'll make it. So I drive home, and I can honestly remember, I went in the ditch on Highway 20, got back out, got home, coming to the house as a junior in high school, hot-headed as could be, walk in, say, I hope you're happy, because I about got died tonight. My dad said, well, I'm glad to see you. I walked down our basement steps, I punched my wall as hard as I could, lost skin on my knuckles, blood on my wall, and I never cleaned it up just so they knew. Looking back, as a parent, I do the same thing to my kid. They didn't care that everybody else was staying down in Des Moines or Cedar Rapids. They didn't care. They're not everybody else's parents. How many of you, quick show of hands, how many of you have a cell phone? Raise your hand. Every one of you. How many of you pay for your own cell phone? Hardly any of you. Here's what I'm going to tell you, young people. This cell phone then, if you don't pay for it, it's not yours. My 13-year-old son and I argue every night about this stupid thing because it is not going to go in his basement where his room is. It is going to be plugged in and sit upstairs where I know where it's at. Because young people, there are so many things in this thing that can get you in so much trouble that I never had when I was a young kid. If I didn't like somebody, I had to tell them that in person. I couldn't tweet at them or post an Instagram or Snapchat them or whatever else you guys do. I had to tell them to their face that I thought they were an idiot. That might change some things in your world. So I would tell you, if your parent doesn't let you take this to your room, good for them. Someday you'll thank them. Just won't be now. Just won't be now. Platforms and opportunities. The biggest thing I got out of that lesson after the tornado, I was at Union High School, great place, loved it. They gave me my first teaching and coaching job. Absolutely loved Union. I was becoming my own coach Thomas there. Then my dad passed away. They asked if I'd come home. But that tornado happened a year before I moved back. Never forget, it was right after school. It was right before they were going to bulldoze the high school. And we have an assembly line of kids handing down helmets and shoulder pads before the school is going to be destroyed. That day the Des Moines Register was there and this guy's interviewing my dad and he's asking him all these questions. And my dad bark orders and then we move, go to move everything to the elementary. It's just my dad and I in his truck. We get everything loaded, we shut the door and I'm 29 years old on this day. I said, Dad, why do you keep doing all these interviews? Why don't you just give this guy a couple quick quotes and say, hey, sorry, I got to move forward. And I'll never forget, 29 years old, I get this. And he said, Aaron, anybody can lead when things are going well. True leadership gets revealed when you're faced with adversity. You think about that. It's not hard to be the captain of your football team when you're undefeated. It's not hard to be all about your volleyball team or your fine arts when you get to lead or you're a starter. That's easy. When you need leadership, when things aren't going so well, that's when special people rise to the top. Because when you get those tough moments, that's when everybody starts doing this. Everybody's looking around. You know, it is easy what I call them front runners. When we're scoring touchdowns or you're ahead in the game or, or you're winning in volleyball and everything, oh, it's easy to cheer and high five everybody. Who does that when you're behind? Who does that when you've lost a game or two in a row? That's leadership. That's what difference makers do. Anybody can lead when things are going well. And I got to watch my dad for 13 months. He prepared me for June 24th by his example after he lost his home and after he lost his school. Going through and think young people, oh, who am I as a person? I think so much as a leader, when we talk leadership, you have to be real with yourself. And I steal this line from Coach Kearns. Coach Kearns' definition of toughness is doing what's right all the time. 
Think about that for a minute. How hard is it to do what's right all the time? Young people, I want you to know you can probably fool your mom, your dad, teachers, coaches, advisors. You know, I, I, the kids that Monday through Friday at school, they'll, teachers come by, they always say the right things. So everybody thinks they do the right thing on the weekend. Your coaches, you know, you show up, you can kind of go through the motions, you can say the right things, rah, rah, even if you don't really mean it. But then you're in the locker room saying things about your teammates, complaining I didn't get the ball enough, questioning why I didn't get to lead in the musical. You can fool adults in your life. And young people, let me tell you this, your mom and dad, most of them want to be fooled. They really don't want to know the truth. They don't want to accept it. You're rarely going to fool your peers. You sitting by, pe by the people you came with in your school, you guys know who you are. You know who you are. You know what they're like. You know their character. You know their integrity. They know, you know what they do Saturday, Friday night, Saturday night. You know if they study and prepare for tests. You know if they copy and cheat. You know, you don't fool your peers near as much as the adults. But most importantly, young people, every morning when you wake up and you look in that mirror, you will never, ever fool yourself. Never. When you look in the mirror, you know what you do. You know if you're a person of integrity. Question, if nobody was watching, would you still do what's right? If you could go steal $200 and nobody would ever find out, what would you do? That's who you are. And at some point, if it doesn't bother you to look in the mirror and know that you're doing things that you shouldn't be doing, that's when you got a problem because now it's become a habit. But young people... You can fool your mom, dad, teachers, coaches, all those people. Not going to fool your peers very often, but you'll never, ever fool yourself. And as a leader, you got to be who you are. Because I can't say all these things if I don't live it. Leading through adversity. I promise every person in this auditorium, you will all lose loved ones. Every one of you. And you don't always get to pick when, why, or how. You may not get the goodbye you think you deserve. But I can promise you this, those people who were close to you, that impacted you, that touched you, you can remember how you honor them. That's why we have this academy. That's why we have the Ed Thomas Family Foundation. And that was not my idea. Not our parents. My dad's visitation, we saw 4,500 people from 1.30 that afternoon to 11.30 that night, people came through. And two of his former players, Casey Wigman, who was our first pro football player, and John Jordan, who's a developer down in Texas, came through and they said to my mom, brother and I, hey, we need to talk to you tomorrow. We got an idea. We want to do something. So we talked to them later on and they said, we want to start the Ed Thomas. We want to continue coach's legacy. We want his impact to continue forward because our young people need it. How did that happen? Because he lost, we lost him, but we didn't forget what he instilled in us. It's because he's who he stood for. It's because what he was doing, his impact, people wanted that to continue. So uh, yes, you don't get to pick. I had to make a choice when I lost my dad. I could be mad, I could be angry, I could be bitter, all those things. My dad was not coming back. It didn't matter how mad I was gonna be. Doesn't matter how mad I'm gonna be. Not gonna change. But I gotta make a choice. Am I gonna get stuck in June 24th the rest of my life? Can I dust myself off, get myself up, and move forward? The other thing, young people, I'm gonna promise you, Things are going to happen to you that you do not ask for and you do not deserve. Okay? You may have relationships go bad. Your mom and dad's relationship might have gone bad. You may not live at a home with two parents. You didn't ask for that. You didn't control that. But you're the only one who determines what do you do next. You may have people say things about you that aren't true. You can't control that. All you can do is respond to it. You, some of you have possibly even been abused, physically or sexually, of which no one deserves and no one should go through. But unfortunately, if it happened to you, you got to make a choice. What do I do with that? Do I let that moment define me? Do I let that person take everything I have to give? 
Or can I move forward? And I'm not saying when you move forward, you never think about it. It doesn't scar you. It doesn't change you. Because I can honestly tell you, there's not a day goes by I don't think about my dad. And I don't think about June 24, 2009. But I got to make a choice. Does it make me better? Does it make me worse? Does it inspire me to do something and overcome? Or does that moment bring me down? I have to make that decision for myself. My brother has to make that decision for himself. My mom has to make that decision for herself. Coach Kearns is impacted by it. Those 22 young people in that weight room, they have to make a decision every day. So things are going to happen to you that you do not ask for, you do not deserve. You got to decide, is that moment going to define who I am or can I dust myself off, get myself up and move forward? Growing up, my dad would often tell me, Life's 10% what happens to you and 90% how you choose to respond. And that's so true. Things are going to happen, as we said. You don't get to pick. You see, my dad was the son of an alcoholic. First 18 years of his life were absolutely nothing like mine. I come from a great two-parent home. My dad did not have that. My dad died at 58 years old and never had one drop of alcohol. Did that make his childhood any better? Absolutely not. But it changed mine. See, young people, you may come from tough homes or tough circumstances, and you got to make a choice. What are you going to do with it? My dad, fortunately, his family tree, he had to build an excuse. He could have been an alcoholic, and nobody would have said, oh, well, his dad was an alcoholic. That's what he should be. But his family tree was going this way. He decided to be a different branch, went a different direction. And because of it, I'm the benefactor. So young people, if you don't have the greatest homes, my encouragement and challenge to you is make sure your kids someday do. Learn from some of the tough things that you had to experience. Want better for yourself and better for your kids. They will thank you, I promise you. I thank my mom and dad every day for what they gave me. I hope I can provide that for my kids. But if my dad would have followed the same road as his father and been an alcoholic, my life would have been different. My kids' lives would have been different. He didn't ask for an alcoholic father, but he decided to do something different about it. What is it that you're going to do when you're through those things? Another thing with your circumstances. I would often hear somebody out there has it worse than you do. Stop complaining. Like I said, I had a great dad for 30 years. Am I going to complain because I only had a dad for 30 years? Some people have no relationships with their fathers, don't know their father. The reason my dad went into teaching and coaching, his high school football coach when he was a freshman in high school, said, Ed, you can be something special. You have a great work ethic and you're a natural leader. Don't limit yourself to what you could do. That conversation and one high school coach believing in my father led him to be a teacher and a coach. Without Coach Dolly, there is no Ed Thomas Family Foundation. There is no, all those young men that he coached for 34 years of high school football. There's no impact on those people. It took one person. Young people, can you think right now, I want you to think about, who is that adult in your life who impacts you? In your schools, can you think of who is your best teachers? Can you think of your best teacher? Do you think they're the smartest person at your school? Or do you think they're their best teacher because they care about you? They're willing to invest in you. That's what difference makers do. A coach led my dad into education, helped him find his passion because he believed in him. He challenged him. He knew how to get the most out of him. But he cared. That's the biggest thing. Dante Harris, a teammate of mine at Drake University, never had a dad. Grew up in foster care his entire life. Every Drake basketball game, I had two parents sitting up in the stands cheering me on. Mom, bring me cookies sometimes even. Take me out to eat. Never once did Dante Harris have parents sitting up there cheering him on. So at 30 years old, when my dad killed him, I'm going to call Dante and say, hey, can you believe somebody killed my dad? Here's a guy who never ever had a dad. And in your life, when you think, oh, it's so hard being me and poor me, I promise you there's kids in your school who wish they could be you for one day. You think about those kids at your school. You know exactly who they are. You think about those kids that when they come to school, that's the only time they eat. They eat school breakfast, they eat school lunch, and they're not eating supper because there's nothing there. You trying to tell me they wouldn't want your spot, your life, your parents, 
who are keeping you make tabs on you? You wonder why some kids show up every day at school even though they never do any assignments? Because the best place in the world for them, they're cared about here. So in those tough days, when you get in those poor me moments, I challenge you to look around your halls and you find somebody you'd like to trade places with you and you ask yourself, would I want to trade places with these people? I promise you, your answer is going to be no. Because somebody out there has it worse than you do. No poor me moments. The last thing I often heard growing up that my dad would tell me is the greatest gift God's given us is the power to choose. And young people, everything, I, every day I think you've got to make choices. The biggest decision you make each and every day when you wake up is what is my attitude for this day? See, attitude is one of the only things in life that only you control. It doesn't matter how old you are. It doesn't matter how much money you make. It doesn't matter what your title is. You are still the only person who decides your attitude. You can say, no, this teacher really bothers me and annoys me or, or my parents, they really make me mad or this and that. Those are excuses. You still got to decide if that's going to bother you or not. I firmly believe when I have a conversation with you, if I talk to a person one-on-one, -on -one, my attitude impacts their day. It's going to make them have a better day or a worse day. And that conversation all depends on my attitude. You think about those people you most like to be around, I guarantee you they're positive people. Their attitude, they're looking forward. They're not looking back. They're not complaining. Your attitude, you control it. This day, when you came to this leadership academy, what was your attitude? Oh, I had to get up early to come to this and listen to people I don't know? Or is it an attitude, hey, I get the opportunity to get there to get better? More importantly, what's your attitude towards class? Oh, I gotta go. This teacher expects so much out of me in Algebra 2. Why can't they just not care and just give us a small assignment? What's your attitude? Or hey, man, they're pushing me. I'm gonna be so much ready for next math class, for calculus. I'm gonna be ready for college because this person's pushing me. Your attitude, such a powerful thing. And as a leader, I will tell you this. If I show up every day at school and I don't wanna be here, how can I ask my teachers or the students to be excited to be at Afflington Parkersburg? If you're gonna lead anything, your attitude better be the model. Because just because I'm the boss, as a principal, if I just tell my teachers, you know, your attitude towards your class is bad. Why don't you have more school spirit? Why don't you work harder? And all I do is complain in the office and tear teachers down. They're not going to want to be here. It starts at the top. So if you're a leader, if you're a captain, if you're a leader amongst your classmates, if your attitude is not one that's positive, nobody else's will be either. Your attitude starts with the top, impacts every single person you come in contact with. One thing after my dad was killed, Coach Kearns called me into the elementary back room of the library. Two days after my dad had passed away, we talked to the football team, told them the funeral arrangements. Coach Kearns calls me in the back. He said, Aaron, I got to meet with Mr. Thompson later today, superintendent. Said, he wants to know kind of my thoughts on how do we move forward? What do we do now that we've lost your dad? Said, any chance you'd consider coming back, taking your dad's job as the athletic director here? And I'll tell you, at first, I'm thinking in my mind, no way. Smaller school, less money. I love coaching basketball. They didn't have basketball open at the time. I knew there's only going to be one Coach Thomas ever at Afflington Parkersburg, and that was going to be my dad. I was at Union becoming the Coach Thomas I grew up wanting to be just like. But I heard Mr. Kearns out out of respect. Talked to my wife, who's smarter than I am. She said, Aaron, what about your mom and how much she enjoys having her three grandkids around? Maybe we can be around to help her. Talked about the 22 kids in that weight room that day. Maybe we could help them. Then I could hear my dad's voice tell me, never forget where you came from. Was I not going to come back to AP when AP needed me the most? Because I didn't want to be compared to my dad and I didn't want to see the bus barn. So I ended up coming home. My first task, I got to go to Applington, where our high school was that year after the tornado, because we had no high school. And I go get my dad's belongings. And on that day, I find this poem hanging up in his office. I'm going to share it with you today, and I think it's in your booklet. Poem says this, it says attitude. The longer I live, the more I realize the impact of attitude on life. Attitude to me is more important than facts. It is more important than the past, than education, than money, than circumstance, than failures and successes, than what other people think, say, or do. It is more important than appearance, giftedness, or skill. It will make or break a company, a church, or a home. The remarkable thing is we have a choice every day regarding the attitude we will embrace for that day. 
We cannot change our past. We cannot change the fact that people act in certain ways. We cannot change the inevitable. The only thing we can do is play on the one string we have, and that is our attitude. I am convinced that life is 10% what happens to me, 90% how I react to it, and so it is with you. We are all in charge of our attitudes. This hangs on my wall in my office because I know if I show up with one bad day of a bad attitude at this school, it's a green light for every teacher to come in with a bad attitude, and it's a green light for every student to come with a bad attitude. So if you're truly going to lead, if you're truly going to lead, it starts with your attitude. And you've got to decide it every day. Does it make people better? Does it make people worse? The second thing that I think you choose each and every day is your time. How do you spend your time? Because you can verbally tell me what matters most to you. Back to those earlier slides, you can lie to me. You can tell me with words what you think I want to hear. But that doesn't mean that's who you are. If I want to see what matters most in your life, where do I look? I look at where do you spend your time? We get 24 hours a day. What do you do with it? If you tell me academics are the most important thing to you, that means I should not have to ask you if you study for every test. That means every single assignment a teacher gives you, you give your absolute best because it's important to you. I know this doesn't happen at your school, but once in a while out in that lunchroom out there, before school, I will find kids copying assignments. I'm sure it's only at Applington Parkersburg does that happen. That tells me that kid, that assignment doesn't matter. Their academics aren't the most important thing. Because if it matters to you, you invest your time in it. If I play a sport, if you tell me my sports matter to me, or the fine arts, my singing matters to me, that means I should never have to ask you if on the weekends you're drinking alcohol or doing drugs. Because if that's really that important to me and the most important thing, then I don't do anything that's going to block me from being successful. So I challenge you to look. What you say matters to you with words really doesn't matter. How do you spend your time? As you get older, the other thing that tells what matters is where you spend your money. Because I don't know anybody who gives money to things they don't believe in. You work too hard for it. But every day you've got to decide, what do you do with your time? What do you do with your money? Because that's what matters most. Words mean nothing, young people. It's actions. 24 hours a day, what are you going to do with it? The last thing I think you decide each and every day is your relationships. Do you care about other people? Or are you just in this thing for yourself? What can I get out of it? What can I get out of a friendship? Because if you do that, it's selfish. It won't work. I learned so much about relationships after my dad passed away. My dad's visitation, like I said, we saw people, 4,500 people. Not because he's a good football coach. Not because he's a good teacher. Because he cared about people. And I heard story after story of things my dad did for people I had no idea about. Former players coming through, hey, do you know your dad bought my cleats for me every year because we couldn't afford them? Another guy, did you know the only reason I went to college is your dad said he believed in me and knew I could do it and he called me every other week in college to make sure I was doing okay. Another guy comes through and said, the day my dad committed suicide, your dad was the first person who came to my house. Sat beside me on my bed, told me none of this was my fault and he sat there and he cried with me. I didn't know any of those things. He didn't do it so everybody would say, well, Ed Thomas, he's a good guy. He did it because he cared. And if as a leader, you want to impact people you got to have relationships. It can't just be what you want from them because that will get you nowhere. They need to know you care about them. I firmly believe each and every one of us are strategically placed to impact specific people. As a high school principal, I have the opportunity to impact my teachers. I work with them at end services. I have one-on-one -on -one meetings with them but they have to know I care about them more than just the person who's teaching ag or math or science. If I want them to truly be the best and be 100% invested, they need more than just me to be their boss. They need to know I care. If you're the captain of your team, it's your job to make sure everybody on that team knows you care, that you're involved. I can't have the same impact on a freshman in high school that a senior can. You think about those young people just coming into your school. Who are they going to look to? Who are they going to follow? What example? 
in the student section, the best example you could ever see. You think a freshman's gonna stand up and lead the cheer? You think a freshman's gonna be the first person to stand up? No, it's juniors and seniors. That freshman will remember though, well, when I'm a junior and senior, this is what I do. Or when I was a freshman, I remember so-and-so, they were up front, they included us, they want us involved. It's about relationships. But each and every one of you have an opportunity that nobody else has to impact other people. I'm only the dad to three kids. I'm their only one who's their dad, my three boys. I've been strategically placed as their father to be the absolute best I can be for those three kids. I'm 280 kids principal. I'm only three kids dad. My question with you is who are you strategically placed to impact? And will you take advantage of it? Even if they can do nothing for you. That new student who comes to your school has nobody to sit with. You got your group of friends. You're going to be that person who reaches out and bites them in? Are you like, huh, sorry, I got my friends. Hope you can find somebody else. How many seniors in the room? Seniors, bad news for you. Next year, unless you have a really bad year, you're not going to be at your high school again. You're going to be a new student somewhere else. You're going to be a freshman again. How do you want to be treated? I firmly believe what goes around comes around. What do you want to do with it? John Maxwell, quite possibly the greatest person on leadership that there is. Get online, Google him, read anything you can find for him. Listen to him speak. And he said, leaders lift. Leaders lift. What's that mean? Leaders make everybody around them better. I saw this from my dad. I didn't understand a lot. My dad had this uncanny ability to find, he had more coaches and managers and staff people and anything else you could imagine on his team. And where did he find them all? He found, sometimes found people who needed it, who had nowhere to go, had no belonging. Our stat guy here at Applington Parkersburg, our historian, Ryan Dillard, as a junior in high school, rarely came to school. We merged. We became Applington Parkersburg his senior year. My dad said, hey, Ryan, or his, I'm sorry, his second year was his senior year. Ryan, I got all these sports records. I need a sports information director. I need you. Ryan didn't miss much school after that. Ryan was 100% all in on making sure our stats are always right and all our school records are up to date. Ryan doesn't graduate if my dad doesn't find a niche for him. Dill still does everything for him. I don't enter quick stats. Any other coaches here? I don't even know how to log into quick stats because Dillard does it all for me. That happened because my dad found somebody who needed something and found him a role and he's flourished. And it wasn't just him, there's other people. So I ask you, who in your school do you need to connect with? Leaders lift. You must be intentional to turn something around. If our school culture or our team is not doing well, you have to be intentional about making it different, about making it better. You can't just talk about it. You have to do something. It takes effort. You must have attention to detail. The little things matter. You want to know the difference in winning and losing, being successful or unsuccessful? It's the attention to details. It's the little things matter. It's not cutting corners. I'll never forget, when we used to warm up for football when I was a kid, I got yelled at if I'd take a corner like this. Warming up, if I rounded off a corner, I got yelled at. Me and the other 86 guys. It was you square a corner, here and go. Did it matter? I would say yes. Attention to detail, all the little things matter. If you're gonna lead, you can't shortcut anything. Because as a leader, if I shortcut it, the person behind me is gonna cut even more. And the person behind them will cut even more. Attention to detail. As a leader, there's a thin line between manipulating people and motivating people. It's close. Because believe it or not, if I lead, I need to motivate people to do things sometimes they don't want to do. I don't force it on them. I get them to buy in. They want to. One, you think it's fun to go out and condition? Anybody like conditioning? Why do you do it? Because you need to do it to be better. And why do you do a little more than whoever you're going to play? 
It's the little things. And your great coaches get you to do that. And you say, yeah, let's go run some more. Motivating, manipulating, it's close. But if you want to lead, you've got to find that fit thin line. Because you can't just manipulate people to get what you want because that comes back to that relationship. They'll know you just use them. Can't use people. You've got to lead them. John Maxwell, three other things. And if you get nothing else, make sure you get these, these three things. This is the most important thing I'm going to tell you today. Before anybody will follow you anywhere, and I don't care if this is as a teacher, as a boss, as a captain, as a parent. Three things every follower needs to know before they will follow you. Number one question people want to know, do you like me? They want to know they care. They want to know that you truly, genuine like them, that you care about them. The second thing people want to know, can you help me? If I'm a part of your organization or on your team, am I going to be better because of it? Will my life be better? Will I be better? Will I be more successful? If the answer is no, they're not going to follow you. The third thing every person wants to know is, can I trust you? If I tell you something that's personal in my life, do I, can I trust you enough to know that I don't have to worry you're going to tell the next person or you're going to put it on social media or you're going to hold it over my head someday if we have a disagreement? And if that person goes through these three questions in their mind or in them, they will follow you to wherever. They will follow you to wherever. Do you like me? Can you help me? Can I trust you? I'm about done, so I got to hustle. One other saying that I absolutely love that Maxwell says, anything worthwhile is uphill. What does that mean? Anything worthwhile is uphill. It means you got to work for it. It takes effort. It takes time. It takes a commitment. Anything worth doing, it's uphill. You got to be willing to work. And I don't care what it is, a sports team, your academic success, building a business. See that big one I put in caps? Marriage. To have a great marriage, you got to work at it. Hopefully none of you are married yet, but I'm telling you, know what going in, you'll be ahead of where I'm at, where I was. Anything worthwhile is uphill. Last quote I'm going to give you, and then I got to close down. This is so true in our society today. People have uphill hopes, but downhill habits. Uphill hopes, downhill. Everybody wants success. What will you do to get it? Nobody comes out saying, you know, I really hope someday I can't find a job and that I'm on welfare and that I do nothing all day long. I don't know anybody who's asked their life aspiration when they're your age. Yet it happens. Sometimes there's circumstances. My question to you, what is your uphill hope? What is it you hope to accomplish? Second question, what are your habits going to do? Are they going to lead you there? Lead you to your hopes or lead you down the hill? Only you decide that. I had more to give you, but I am out of time. I truly thank you all for coming. I hope you'll take time to thank your teachers, your coach, your parents who's ever impacted your life to help you get here today. You want to make a difference and have an impact? Hand write somebody a letter sometime. You won't believe what that'll do for them. At this time, we're going to bring Mark Reifenrath, who's on our board as well. And Mark's going to talk to you about something a little bit different. We're going to try some quick huddles. Anybody who knows our football, my dad had this saying, it was called the quick huddle. We come out, ready, break, clap, and away we go. So we got some questions. One feedback we get is we're not always interactive enough. So please help me welcome Mark. Thank you for being here. I hope you have a great day. All right. Like, like Aaron mentioned, we're going to do the quick huddle. That's what Ed Thomas always ran in football, and we kind of want to do that right now.